Yeah. Crouch down low. When you hit the when you hit this ramp, crouch down low. Crouch down low. There you go. There you go, buddy boy. Oh, crouch down. Crouch down. Nice. Yeah. Nice <laughs> job. Okay, chef. So at the time, I was ready to just okay, quit down. university, move to Southern Cal, try to get sponsored. I was, I was like studying graphic design so that I could work for skate companies because that's what I wanted to do. I just wanted to be embedded in that culture. So you're like pioneering in your own city where other people just see a courthouse or something. You're seeing a place to like have this, this moment where you're risking and you're capturing it on film and you're going to add music to it and you like have your like outfit, you know? It's all like, it's this hybrid sort of urban art form. Songs were always just this addendum or supplement to the thing I was really into. But then all of a sudden these songs were like taking flight and had a life of their own. And I had to like pay attention to that. It's a new day, things are gonna change. It's a new day, things are gonna change. It's a new day. Man, I felt freedom with sound, and I felt freedom in the Lord, and that imprint was on those, and I think it was, for whatever reason, it was the type of sound at the time that people were like, you know, you gotta hear this. Have you heard this? I, mean, I would have many people say that it was like their joy to like, they found it and they felt like they found something special and no one knows about this. And they felt like it was almost their mandate to like tell people about it because they knew that it was like just this dude in Indiana making music in his bedroom that you can get a hold of on his Hotmail account. You know what I mean? So I think there was almost like this, you know, this undergroundness to it that people almost took it upon themselves to like share it as much as they could, which in hindsight, man, that's what you'd hope for. It's interesting to see the story of where someone comes from. And I feel like as far as like an audio recording, these early songs feel like my origin story. And your spiritual autobiography too. Yeah. Bliss of marijuana splits and alcoholic flips. I got so sick and tired of it. So I lived in an intern house with about 13, 14 other guys, bunk style, like seven of us in a room. And we had this one room that we would go into. Um, it was a room where no one slept and it was supposed to be sort of a place of solace, you know, where someone could go and actually study or pray. Or in my case, I set up like this little corner where I did my recordings. That's part of the beauty, I think, of some of the old work is the parameters were tight. It was like one mic, an eight track recorder. What can you make in your bedroom? And it's, there's an immediacy to that. I bought my first sampler because I grew up listening to hip hop music, East Coast hip hop, where sampling is like the backbone of all those old songs. You know, they'd sample Al Green, James Brown, put a drum beat to it, and you have like, you know, Public Enemy or, uh, you know, De La Soul song or something. At the time, you know, I was making $25 a week as an intern at a church. So to be able to like go and, you know, like, sell 20 CDs and make a few hundred bucks playing music and have people actually excited to hear what I was doing was like, it was really exciting. Actually, the ability to burn a CD was like new technology. Like, whoa, you could buy a double CD burner from Sony and put like your CD on one side and a blank CD on the other side and it'll like burn CD quality. And it takes about 20 minutes per CD. So I would do that um, and then hand assemble, Xerox copy the covers and put stickers on the CDs. <laughs> and Michelle would come over and we'd sit there and it would take us a day to make like 20 of them, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'd go play like an open mic or... Mm -hmm. Sometimes drive maybe six hours to do a show and get paid a hundred bucks. That's right, dude. Like you're Young and hungry. Your Young and hungry. That's how it made its way around to like Hawaii, and I would hear it like in other countries. And these were just CDs being burned, burned, burned. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Which is wild. When you're talking 2002 to 2005, that was still a, a time when like the music 
industry was still done a certain way that it had been done for many, many years. And so I think being independent, being indie rock, you know, back then, it, it felt like more of a bold stance. And we would like pinch ourselves as newlyweds in 2006, 2007, that it was actually working. I think we still pinch ourselves though. Because it's still maybe kind of an anomaly that like, whenever I tell people that like, you're a musician and we're a family of seven, and you're what not, else does he do? You're I'm like, no, he, he really he just sings you're, songs. He's independent, <laughs> and you're not on the label. Or, you know, yeah. it's just it. I think it still feels really special. Yeah. Um, that you can do what you do. You can do it from home. Um, I can stay at home with the kids, so we're a single income family yeah. and a lot of kids, <laughs> and that we can, <laughs> that we can make it. You yeah. know, somehow, even in the Spotify era, which has changed. Yeah a lot but we're still able to make it yeah which feels we feel really blessed and like we've been richly provided for like it feels very it still feels very special yeah the only way this works is people listen and if they dig it they decide to share it with other people mm -hmm. it's shared differently now you know it used mm -hmm. to be burning a cd or whatever and now it's just sharing a link you know <laughs> But yeah, there's still that fact that we wouldn't be able to do this if people weren't tuning in and listening and sharing with others. You know, that's always been how it's worked. It's always been word of mouth. Always. <laughs> when I buried these songs years ago, I didn't really even think twice about like reintroducing them to people. I sort of was like always thinking like move forward, new stuff, those served a purpose, but yeah, I'm done. But it's been interesting to be at this point in life to come back here and sense like somehow even the need to go back and remember things, you know? But yet there was something about that early work where you're just stoked that God did this thing in you. And you just, you just want to tell everyone and sing about it, you know? It's fun now as like a grown man to even like dust off this early work and mix it well. We like mixed this as best we could and mastered it to tape and kind of gave these old, old lo-fi recordings sort of the royal treatment. Hallelujah.